Welcome, everyone. Again, thank you for being here. My name is Jane Boutwell, and today we're going to talk about traits of top-tier talent, and specifically accountability and communication, and why you should care. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, please feel free to chat with me and um, I'll make sure and read it. And then if you'd like to receive a copy at the end of the presentation, chat PDX Mindshare in your email address in private. And if you'd like to be connected with me after the webinar, chat PDX Mindshare that you would like an introduction. All right. So I have a question for you. When you look at this image, what does it communicate to you? Any idea who this is or what she does or why we should even care? So for those that you have, might have missed, this was an amazing feat. This was from the past 2018 Winter Olympics. And this is a photo of Jesse Diggins at the finish of the cross-country team sprint freestyle relay. It's a mouthful. Um, but Jesse Diggins and Kiki and Randall of the United States crossed the finish line to win gold, becoming the first Americans to win an Olympic gold medal in cross-country skiing, ever. So by the way, the only other medal that we've won in cross-country was a silver in 1976. So the, the big takeaway here is, first of all, it's been a sport dominated by northern European countries, and the fact that we came out and took gold is amazing. And as top-tier athletes, with, as the case with Jesse and Kikian, um, their job is to train daily, fully committing to the work that needs to be done to become the best in their field. So they've taken ownership and accountability to be the best. And today, I'd like to share with you what skills are needed to be top-tier talent. And very simply, to be the best in your field, to be top-tier talent requires a commitment and accountability in your communication. So just to give us a little roadmap of where we're heading, well, we're going to talk about the trends, um, specifically looking at industry trends and demands for specific skill sets. And then we'll talk about the right way to hold yourself and others accountable and the role that communication plays in accountability. So here are some of the projected trends in the professional skill set. The U.S. economy is expected to generate 55 million jobs by the year 2020. 24 million of these jobs will be entirely new positions. And of those new positions, Almost half will emphasize a mix of hard and soft intellectual skills, with those skills being communication, leadership, active listening, analytics, and administration. And of all of those skills I just listed, can you guess what the number one most desired skill across all industries would be? If you guessed communication, you are correct. So we all know you can have the best idea, the most innovative new product or service, but if you can't communicate why your product is the best or why your service or software will streamline business processes, it really won't matter. So communication is key. But why should accountability and communication matter to you or your team or your company? So ask yourself this question. Are there people that you work with <clears throat> or that work for you that might have their technical skills in play? So that is, they're, they're awesome at analytics. They're the best programmer. Um, they're really good at marketing or finance, whatever it is. Technically, they're solid, right? But this same person is mentioned by his or her peers as difficult to work with, and their name pops up at review time because, well, Maybe they have difficulty working in a team environment. They take credit on a team project and don't acknowledge the work of others. Or they have difficulty accepting constructive feedback. 
So the point being, you can be the best at what you do, but if no one wants to work with you, how are you valuable to your company? Sometimes I think it's easier to grasp the direction and the topic at hand by understanding what we are not talking about. In this, uh, in this book, Mark Murphy, it's called Hiring for Attitude, he lists characteristics of low performers. So those people in the organization that are probably, you could say, that are on the line, um, their, their tenure with the company might be in question. And some of the characteristics of low performers he lists as they're negative, they feel entitled. They're the people that don't take initiative. They don't think outside the box. They have a tendency perhaps to procrastinate. They resist change and create drama for attention. And here's the big kicker. They're the ones that constantly blame others. They're the ones that blame others when a project is late, they blame others when um, the timelines weren't met or any of those things. And blaming others is the absolute opposite in accountability. So let's take a look at what accountability is and what it should look like in the work environment. So Harvard Business Review published an article by Peter Bregman titled, The Right Way to Hold People Accountable. This was done in January of 2016. But it's a great article talking about, in a work environment, the people that you're with, whether you are the boss or you're the peer or a subordinate, how can you model and look at and hold people accountable? And what he writes is, accountability is about delivering on a commitment. It's not simply taking the blame when something goes wrong. It's not a confession. It's a responsibility to an outcome, and not just the task and duties required to get the job done. It's taking initiative with thoughtful, strategic follow-through. So what does this look like in the workplace? Well, he mentions five specific areas to look at when holding people accountable. And these are the five areas. All five of these areas are necessary at all levels in a corporate hierarchy. So for example, it's important to keep in mind that executives high on the org chart, the senior level, if you will, can't really be accountable unless the people who report to them also follow through on their commitments. So here are the steps to foster accountability in the people around us. Number one, clear expectations. And in my opinion, I'm not sure if there, you can ever be too clear when it comes to expectations, particularly on a project or in a team environment. Step one in human accountability is to be crystal clear on the expectations, clear about the outcome, what you're looking for. How will you measure success? And three, how those involved should achieve the objective. So this is often where brainstorming has an effective role, particularly when you're pulling together a team of resources from diverse business functions, uh, diverse in education, culture, background, et cetera, right? You're pulling together a diverse group of people. Setting expectations up front is paramount. Number two in holding accountability is clear capability. So whether you point someone as the lead or you are pulling together a team of talent, consider what skills are needed to achieve the objective. So what specific skills does the person need to meet the expectations? What resources are needed, right? And resources not just in human, we're talking financial equipment, et cetera. And how about this? If there's a skill set missing, can this be learned or acquired during the process? If there's a skill or capability missing and it's not addressed and contingencies aren't planned for, you are setting your person or team up for failure. So part of setting expectations is understanding the capabilities of the pre people on the team. Going back to the expectations conversation, the step one, you should agree on weekly milestones. 
right, with clear, measurable, measurable objective targets. So if these targets slip, you have to get on it immediately. And one of the solutions is brainstorming. Identify a fix. And you might have to redesign the schedule and reprioritize resources to get back on track. And I'll say this, this is something noteworthy, nothing frustrates leaders more than being surprised by failure. All through the process, the steps clear communication needs to take place. If a team member fails on a task because they were too afraid to ask for help, the entire team and maybe even the project suffers. So communication up front and throughout the entire process is key. So the fourth step in accountability in the workforce and holding those accountable is honest, open, and ongoing feedback. And, and I think as humans, we need and even crave feedback sometimes to hear and affirm that we're doing a good job or that we're on the right track. This is motivating. This doesn't mean unnecessary hand-holding. It's, it's an affirmation of meeting expectations, a timeline, and working towards the target. It's important to note that if you have been clearly communicating the expectations, the capabilities, and awareness of those on the team and their capabilities, and you've kept track of the measurements, that the feedback at this stage, it can be fact-based and easier to deliver. It appears you are not attacking the person as much as the process. So if there are some tweaks or improvements to be made, it's much easier to refer back to the process, going back to the expectations, the objectives, and the outcome, right? So it's kind of that third person idea as opposed to attacking the person you're giving feedback more or less about the process and making sure that that's clear. And finally, the last step to fostering accountability in the workplace, again, if you've been clear on all of the steps above, expectations, capabilities, measurement, feedback, you can be reasonably sure you did what's necessary to support their performance. So according to Bergman, if, if all that has taken place, you have three choices at this point in terms of accountability. Re and he has the three steps is repeat, reward, and release. So repeating the steps above if you feel that there's still a lack of clarity in the system. If there was success, celebrate the success. Reward that there was success in the accountability that's taken place. And if there is not success, but you've been clear throughout the process on all the steps, clear in your communication, then they, that person, may not be a good fit for the role and you should release them from the role. So it's important to note, depending on the magnitude of the task or the assignment might dictate what level of release from the said roles required, right? So it could be they're just released from that particular task. Maybe they're released from the team. Or, heaven help, worst case scenario, maybe it's a situation for they're released by their position in the company. So we've talked about accountability and fostering an environment of accountability and what those steps look like. Now it's time to get clear on communication. And so talking specifically about accountability and ownership in your communication. So the things, what you say, how you say it, and how you write it. In verbal communication, we have the seven C's. And mastering verbal communication is a skill that takes practice and focus. And you might be sitting there thinking, Jane, uh, yeah, we talk every day. True. And then ask yourself, do people listen? Listen to what you're saying? Or do they simply hear you? And to me, there's a huge difference. We can hear noises going on in the background, right? Phones ringing, coworkers having conversations, maybe the elevator in the office is dinging, right? We call that background noise. And, and think about this. Are there people that you work with that sometimes they'll just talk 
and eventually it becomes background noise because we have so much coming at us during our working hours, work, email, meetings, communicating, social media, right? It's easy to get sidetracked and not stay focused on any particular conversation. It's easy to ramble. Maybe you know people that talk in tangents, get off track, maybe even you know, not speaking up. This is one of my other things when you're, when you're talking about a chemi- uh, accountability in your communication, avoiding the verbal crutches, the ums, ands, ahs. So great communication in a perfect world incorporates these seven verbal concepts. Here's something to think about, just to reiterate the clarity and the seven Cs. If you are giving someone directions, but you didn't give the end destination address, your communication would be incomplete and unclear, and the person you're giving the directions to probably wouldn't end up where they're supposed to. So it goes without saying, being mindful of clarity, correctness, completeness, and being courteous are all habits that when practiced will set you apart from your competition. And, and to be 100% um, clear on what I mean, this is verbal communication, the words coming out of your mouth. And most often, when we talk about communication, and I'll ask you this, if I say communication, are you thinking the words coming out of your mouth? Or are you thinking that there's more involved than that? And most people tend to think it's the words, but there's more. When we have clear communication, our words match our nonverbal. And a critical step is making sure that you are consistent in your communication. And what I mean by that specifically is that your actions, your nonverbal communication, needs to match what you've said, your verbal communication. So let me give you an example. How about if you're a new person, new member on a team, and one of your new teammates says to you, nice to meet you, welcome to the team. But you noticed they don't, look, they don't make eye contact with you. Heck, they don't even look up from your laptop, and yet you're the newbie on the team. And so my question is, does the nice to meet you, welcome to the team match their nonverbal behavior? And then as a person, do you really feel like they were happy to meet you or that you are truly welcome? Nonverbal behavior, uh, nonverbal communication can be as much as 93% of our communication. So going back to the seven C's and looking at this chart, the little black pie area, that represents verbal communication, the words that come out of our mouth. Then you'll see the orange section, which is visual, and we're going to talk about that in the subsequent slides, but that's, there's eight noted nonverbal behaviors and that we'll go into. And then almost 40%, the 38% is what's called oral communication, and that's what your audience hears. That involves tone and pitch and volume. So again, when we're talking about the significance and, and, and being consistent and accountable in your communication, to me that clearly means marrying up what you say with your actions. So we've talked about verbal communication, hit on that, the clarity and, and correctness and so forth. Now let's look at the eight nonverbal behaviors. So the first one being facial and facial features and you know this can be as simple as a smile, a frown, happiness, sadness, it's what you're displaying on your face. And often our facial expressions are consistent throughout the world, right? So a smile on your face when you're going to another company generally connotes friendliness and, and approachability. And here's something to think about. 
if, if a film was made in the United States and English is the main language and it gets translated into a language in any other world and you saw that film in another country with subtitles, you probably won't have a problem picking out the villain given the facial expressions, body language, and posture. You probably wouldn't even need the subtitles. That is how powerful nonverbal communication is. Perhaps you've heard about the book, Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands. It's just this great little encyclopedia of uh, information about cultural communication and when you travel abroad and go to visit different countries, what to look for and how they communicate differently than we do in the U.S. So, for example, some things to keep in mind, whereas our culture, smiling, like I said, demonstrates friendliness, approachability, um, maybe even trustworthiness. And in Japan, a smile can mean pleasure, for sure, but it can also mean a means of self-control, as in when it's used to hide disapproval or anger. So from a cultural standpoint, you can't just assume because they have a pleasant smile on their face, maybe they are unhappy or uncertain of the situation. Another nonverbal behavior is gestures. So gestures include deliberate movements, signals, waving, pointing fingers for num uh, numeric amounts, and then open and closed gestures. And I have, I included these um, images, and I think that they're, at least to me, you don't even have to have words underneath. You can tell what they're saying. The first guy has his mouth or his finger up to his lips saying, be quiet, woman's on the phone. So I would call these clear, nonverbal gestures easily understood. Again, some things to be careful of. What I'm sharing in this presentation are generally accepted principles in the culture of the United States. Once you travel outside of that, some of our norms, some of the gestures that we use are thought of in a different way. So for example, you can see the image of the woman on the lower right section of the screen and she's holding up the V sign. In New Zealand, for example, if you did the V for victory sign, it's considered rude and obscene if you do it with a palm facing you. So just be careful about the gestures that we use, right? In the Middle East, you would never want to do a thumbs up sign that's offensive throughout all of the Middle East. So another behavior, probably one of the most, I think, telling of the nonverbal behaviors is eye gaze. So eye gaze includes looking, staring, blinking, and it's um, generally accepted that when people encounter things that they like, their rate of blinking increases and their pupils dilate. And perhaps you've heard this term that windows are the eye to the soul. And as a parent, I can often look at my kids in the eye and I can tell just by looking at the eyes if they're being truthful. I can tell if they have something that they want to share. I can tell if they're upset. I can tell if they're sick. I mean, the eyes will tell us a lot, and you don't even have to know someone. You could probably make certain assumptions as well. So in our Western culture, we appreciate and even expect eye connection when in a conversation. We often think if the other person isn't looking at us, Maybe you wonder, are they communi communicating disinterest or they're bored? Maybe they have something to hide. So again, in our culture, eye contact, it's not just a, it's not just a respect. It's letting someone know that um, you're on board, you want to hear what they're saying, and that you're listening. By the way, if you happen to be in Australia, Germany, or Hungary, um, strong eye contact is very important and it implies clear, honest communication. If you are, for example, in Germany and you fail to give um, eye contact, the impression that you are untrustworthy comes to mind. So it's 
it's not on it's not that different than our culture, but um, just something to be aware of. Okay, also under the nonverbal umbrella of communication behavior is this notion of paralinguistics. And this paralinguistics is great. Even though it's something that you hear, it still falls under nonverbal. And hopefully when I walk through this slide, it'll make sense as to why. So our voice is this amazing toolbox and includes a wide range of different tools that we can use in communication to generate interest and gain audience engagement. And here's what I mean by that. So tone. When, you, when tone is what your audience hears, and perhaps your mom or your dad used to say, don't use that tone of voice with me. They're talking about what they're hearing from you. And another, to, just to put a clear image of your head, when you think of the tone of someone's voice that's memorable, iconic, I personally think of like James Earl Jones, who was the first Darth Vader, or Morgan Freeman as the voice of God, right? Very rich, deep tone in their voice. Pitch is another tool that we can use. And pitch includes the rate of vibration by vocal cords. So as the number of vibrations per second increases, the voice goes higher. So think about when you're excited or maybe you're nervous and all of a sudden your voice starts to raise up in notches. That has to do with the pitch of your voice. And of course there's volume that we can use as a tool. And the loudness, this is the loudness or the softness, right? And, and here's one of the tricks as a public speaker that I'll use. If you're in a room and you're mic'd up and it's starting to get a little bit loud, Sometimes as a speaker, I'll start to get quieter just to get the audience to hush and pay attention. So it's an effective tool if it's used properly. Another tool for verbal, or pardon me, the paralinguistic is pace. So think of this as how fast or how slowly you speak. You can create excitement in a story by talking faster. Think about if you have kids, when, you're, when they're telling you about their day and they were so excited talking about the friends that they were playing with and all of a sudden their voice speeds up, this is the pace of their, of their voice. And articulation is something that also is a tool to use. Um, I can't say articulation without thinking of the, it's a classic movie, My Fair Lady, with Audrey Hepburn as My Fair, she played Eliza Doolittle where she literally says, the rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. But she has to keep reciting this, and it's part of the articulation. And lastly, one of probably, in my opinion, the most effective tools is the pause. A well-placed pause can create anticipation and interest in what's to follow. So think about comedians. Can you imagine if comedians were up in front and they're delivering a joke and they don't take any time and they just run ahead and all the way to the punchline? It all of a sudden loses its meaning. It loses the, you know, the delivery is lacking. So in a conversation or if you're trying to really instill an important point, a well-placed pause can be highly effective. I've included this photo of, um, this is one of my most favorite TED Talks, and it is, this is an image of U.S. Navy Admiral William McRaven, and he's delivering the commencement speech to the University of Texas at Austin. And the title of his presentation is, If You Want to Change the World, Start Off by Making Your Bed. So in this speech, he talks about the importance of doing the little things like making your bed, embracing the fears of life, and changing the world for generations to come. He also does an amazing job of using his voice as a tool. So he, throughout his TED Talk, he'll give well-planted pauses. He'll switch up his tone, the pace. It's, I, I encourage you to watch it. It's a great um, TED Talk. 
but to me, back to the little things. So doing the little things includes being clear and consistent with your daily verbal and nonverbal communication. So another nonverbal behavior that falls under the um, umbrella of communication is body language and posture. And um, research by the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University linked sitting or standing with expansive posture, wide open and tall, with personal feelings of power and confidence in decision making and control. And how many of you have seen the TED Talk by Amy Cuddy, where I think it's entitled, Your Body Language May Shape Who You Are. But she had to overcome some really powerful personal challenges. And I won't blow it by telling you what they are, but she gives this amazingly powerful TED Talk about how when you want to summon strength and courage and, and maybe you have a difficult message to deliver or you're going in to face a challenge, she talks about these power poses and, and just by simply standing, think of like a Wonder Woman, by standing in these poses, it gives you this strength and power and it's, it's awesome. Another study, this was done by the Department of Kinesiology and Health and Science, um, revealed that people with an upright posture easily recall positive thoughts and tend to have a stronger self-image. This can also help them push aside negative thoughts and worry. So you'll see I have images of, um, this is actually navy down on the lower right, but when I think of body language and posture and, and near perfect posture, I can't help but think of the military. And there, there's a reason. They spend so much time right from the get-go out of when you're in basic training on military, what they call military bearing, which includes your posture and stance and, and when you're at parade rest. So posture is about self-confidence and it's about communicating in the most clear way who you are. So one of the, another of the nonverbal communications uh, to be aware of is haptics, which think of it as touch. So touch and communicating affection or familiarity or sympathy or Think about your iPhone, and now they have haptics on your iPhone. So it's a method of interacting with computers and electronic devices. Um, it incorporates feedback and an output or input or output device that senses the body movement. So think of like a joystick when you're playing video games. But we're literally melding the human aspects of us with the feedback from our technical or the electronic side. And, and in our culture now, this has become a subject of a lot of controversy, the whole notion of touch. And so many organizations have a no-touch policy. So maybe you walk down the hall and you see a friend and, you know, in the past you might pat him on the shoulder and say, good to see you. Well, now you, it's not acceptable at all, no touch. And that's something to be aware of. On the flip side, I think it, this is according to Kiss, Bow, and Shake Hands, the book. You know, you go to a, company or a country like Costa Rica, you know, women will often pat each other in their right forearm and shoulder instead of shaking hands. So it's acceptable for us to shake hands, but over there, there's still, there's a limited amount of this. And it's um, haptics or touch can be obviously very powerful as well, used appropriately in communication. And appearance. What does your appearance say about you? So we have some examples here, but appearance includes your choices in not just the clothing that you wear, the colors that you wear, the hairstyles, whether you choose to have piercings or body tattoos, whatever it is, it's, it's your overall, the image that you're projecting to others. And ask yourself, 
what does your appearance say about you? And yes, there's days that you're going to be professional and go to work. Maybe there's days that you're casual. But, but even then, when you have that much of a, of a shift, you're still making conscious choices of how you want to present yourself in your appearance. And one of the things when I'm working with clients and, and um, we talk a lot about first impressions, and research tells us that a first impression is anywhere from two to seven seconds. So let's think about this. Let's say you have a job interview, and, and let's up the ante. It's a panel interview where there are four people sitting around a table. And it takes you, let's just assume, about five seconds to walk through the door and take a seat. Your four potential employers that are sitting around the table are looking at you. They're looking at how you move, how you carry yourself, do you have good posture, are you making eye contact, do you have a friendly, welcoming smile on your face? So in those five seconds, you haven't even uttered a word, and in that brief time, you are being evaluated based on your nonverbal communication. To me, that is one of the most powerful lessons to learn. And as a matter of fact, I, I share this. I'll ask people, well, when do you think the interview starts? And oftentimes people will say, well, when I sit in the chair. And I'm like, well, back up a second because consider your context. Consider the environment. You know, nowadays it depends on where you're interviewing, but if you're downtown Portland, for example, or if you're out at the Nike campus and it's a building surrounded by windows and you can actually look out and see the parking lot, and people have been known to do this, and you're looking out and you see a person getting out of their car, well, maybe there's someone that's going to be in that you're interviewing with and you're getting out of the car and you're juggling things and adjusting yourself. Guess what? That's part of the first impression. That's part of the interview process, and you probably aren't aware of that. So I always just tell people, you know what? Your interview, assume that it starts when you get out of the car. Last under the eight steps of nonverbal communication is proxemics. So in this chart, it shows general guidelines for our culture in the US. So keep in mind, when you are working with people from other countries, an individual's personal space might be closer than our own comfort level. So for example in here, our personal space, what's arguably acceptable in a, in a work environment, is anywhere from 18 inches to 4 feet. And then you go out from there, the social space 4 feet to 12 feet, and public, et cetera, longer. The intimate space, the 0 to 18 inches, Think about this. Have you ever been in an environment where someone invades your personal space? And what's your natural inclination? What do you naturally do? You back up, you take a couple steps back. Well, again, in other cultures, their personal space and their intimate space is much closer. So just having an awareness of what's acceptable to you, but also what's acceptable to people that you work with. So we've, we've just reviewed all the eight nonverbal communication behaviors, which included facial, ge facial gestures, eye gaze, paralinguistics, body language and posture, haptics, appearances, and proxemics, right? That falls under the umbrella of nonverbal communication. Now, how about accountability and what we write? How many times do you find yourself composing an email and not really paying attention to the essentials? Our inboxes are inundated with emails and we want to keep our daily to-do list manageable. So we hit reply and bang out an email that we didn't give 100% of our attention to and we inadvertently omit information. Back in journalism, we would say that a story wasn't complete if you couldn't answer the five W's. The who, what, when, where, and why. Sometimes how. So completeness and um, and refers to do you have all the necessary information. I am showing this email here as an example of not the best email to be written. It's a paragraph and I don't know about you, but I don't want to read it. There's no visual breaks in it and it's not complete. But, but it has to do 
it's more than just the content that we need to be mindful of, right? So thinking about formatting. And, and when you take a couple minutes to think about formatting it, it's a difference of someone reading your email right away or maybe they'll get back to it in about a day or two. Also be mindful of the tone in our emails. For example, in our culture, we're pretty, we accept that when you type in all caps, it's almost like someone's shouting at you. So this is an example of an email that is certainly easier on the eyes to read. And, and why is that? Well, they've included bullet points. There's actual white space around it. And so visually, it's much more appealing. It's easier to read. And it's more complete in terms of who's involved and um, the accountability on both sides of what they're both providing. So we've talked about trends in the industry in terms of what, what the job market will look like in a couple years and specifically what skills are needed, what type of skills will be required and desired for future job positions with the number one most desired skill across all industries being communication. We've talked about the right way to hold people accountable by clearly communicating expectations, capabilities, measurements, feedback, and consequences. And lastly, we've talked about what clear, clear communication looks like by being mindful of our nonverbal and written communication and what clear communication sounds like when we practice the seven C's. This is one of my favorite quotes. The art of communication is the language of leadership. And by the way, for those of you that don't know, James Hughes was a famous speech writer writing for past presidents, Reagan, Bush, Ford. And I would say right now, just to give you something to take away, you know, we live in an incredibly competitive world. Companies can market to and attract top talent from all over the world. To set yourself apart from your competition, continue to hone and develop your hard skills as well as your soft skills. And taking ownership and accountability with your communication will make you a more marketable and desired top tier talent. So again, thank you so much for coming, for giving me a little bit of your time this afternoon. Here's a couple of reminders. Uh, you can email Paris at, uh, Paris at Anvil Media for more details. And then just something to make note of, uh, as proud sponsors of this year's Digital Summit Portland Conference, They've teamed up with uh, PDX Mindshare and members get a $50 discount code, which is MIND, M-I-N-D, 50, on registration. So you could go to portland.digitalsummit.com to register. And again, thank you and have a great rest of your afternoon.